together again on Wednesday to end of the day to lift up our regrets, our hopes, our, our, uh, our sense of uh, longing for God's word to be on our minds as we end our day and, and go to sleep, to have God's word ringing through our, uh, the, the ears of our mind, our memories as we lay down. And uh, tonight, we'll be encouraged as we uh, continue our reading from St. John's account of the Passion, the arrest, the trial, the betrayal, the beating, the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, all which we've seen week after week, Jesus has allowed. And, uh, and as we tonight look at the, the crucifixion scene, we look at three aspects of of the of what took place and we'll be encouraged at the kindness of Jesus for uh, for the world for us and even for his mom so uh, we rejoice in everything that Jesus has done for us and I pray that uh, our our deep look at it our quiet look this evening will uh, will give us some things that will stay with us for the rest of our life as we're encouraged by what Jesus has done and who he is for us even now. Uh, we're also reflecting on, on baptism a little bit each evening because that baptismal event in Romans chapter 6, we're told that when we were baptized, we were united to Christ. We were buried with him. We were joined with him in a death like his, buried with him in our baptism. And how much more will we be raised with him? also in our baptism. And so uh, very often Holy Week is the final preparations for baptisms and uh, Good Friday, Holy Saturday, uh, Easter Sunday can include a lot of baptisms. So whether we were baptized the weekend of Easter or not, we remember that that's where God has transported us, transported our sins to that death on the cross. And as we see, as we read of him actually crucified today, uh, we can remember that our sins were there. And he is here for us. Our opening hymn today is What a Friend We Have in Jesus. And the number that's in the bulletin is incorrect. It's actually 770 in your service book. <laughs>
name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. O oh Lord, open my lips, and my mouth will declare your praise. Make haste, O oh God, to deliver me. Make haste to help me. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. What, bap what benefits does baptism give? Which are these words and promises of God? What does such baptizing with water indicate? Where is this written? reading for this evening is from Paul's letter to the Philippians, the second chapter, verses 1 to 11, Christ's example of humility. So if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from rivalry or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but made himself nothing taken the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name so that the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. O Lord, have mercy on us. Please stand. We have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the Righteous One. Who 
Blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. We have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the Righteous One. The Holy Gospel according to St. John, the 19th chapter. So they took Jesus, and he went out bearing his own cross to the place called the place of a skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. There they crucified him, and with him two others, one on either side, and Jesus between them. Pilate also wrote an inscription and put it on the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this inscription, for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Aramaic, in Latin, and in Greek. So the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write, The King of the Jews, but rather, This man said, I am King of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his garments and divided them into four parts, one part for each soldier, also his tunic. But the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from top to bottom. So they said to one another, Let us not tear it, but cast lots for it to see. Let's, but cast lots for it to see whose it shall be. This was to fill the scripture which says, They divided my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. So the soldiers did these things. But standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold, your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her, to be, took her to his home. This is the gospel of the Lord. You be seated. We sing our, our hymn.
grace and peace to you. There were a number of years ago, uh, long, long time ago, many, many years ago, so don't worry, you aren't, anyone here or even on the live stream aren't the cause of this sadness, so don't even think it. But, uh, but I was feeling really sunken, feeling really sad, feeling really kind of picked on, disrespected, and it was a long time ago, so, uh, and I remember being at the Sam Station gas pump, and I was sinking down as I was thinking about people's treatment of me way back long ago, and I was filling the gas tank, and I was, I was kind of getting in a sadder mood with every memory, with every thought. And then my mind went to events like what we just read. As Jesus went to the cross and the, the ridicule, the disrespect, the, the bullheaded bullyingness that was directed at him. And as I thought on that, something changed in my feelings, something changed in my outlook on what had happened to me. And I felt better. The treatment, the events didn't seem to own my thinking, my emotions. Is remembering that Jesus, as we read in Philippians here, not counting the equality that he had with the Godhead, right? Father, Son, Holy Spirit, something to be grasped, held on to, kept, but he humbled himself, taking upon the form, the, the mode, the mission, of the servant, and he endured the cross, scorning its shame, it says. And we just read in this section of the gospel according to John of three things in this little nugget that can be encouraging to us. Who knows when, maybe right now, maybe tonight, or maybe Remembering Jesus and these details and the songs that are a little bit, you know, quieter songs reflecting on the passion and what we have in a God who would suffer, a God who would allow himself to be humiliated, even into death, to be sent for us. That that would have a power of encouragement restoration, and as we'll talk about this coming Sunday, also personal mission, as we're called also to servanthood um, in the name of Jesus. Now we look at the three, three aspects of this portion of the passion, where Jesus is uh, sent to the cross and the sign is nailed above him saying, here is the king of the Jews, also, the, the, the details that the Holy Spirit has preserved for us of the soldiers gambling and casting lots for his clothing and uh, his care for his mom there at the end. So the first, the, the sign, the inscription that Pilate had written to be posted. It was written in a language that most everyone would be able to understand, three languages actually, Aramaic, which was the language, common language of the Hebrew people, <coughs> the Arabic people, Latin, which was the official language of the Roman Empire, and Greek, which was the, the language of commerce for the entire region beyond just what was the Roman Empire, because the Alexander the Great, the Greek warrior, had laid siege to all of Persia, so what is 
Iraq and Iran and Afghanistan, all these countries had uh, been uh, uh, conquered by the Greeks. And so it was a widespread language of doing business. And so Pilate had written, Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews, in these three languages. Interesting that it would point out that he was from Nazareth. Nazareth didn't have a good reputation. Can anything good come out of Nazareth? One of the disciples, when he first heard of Jesus, that was his exclamation. You know, uh, in, in parts of Texas, and I was a high school when I first in high school when I first encountered this. I had gone for uh, all state choir in the middle. You know, of, I guess this time of the year is when that happens. And um, others from Texas, we were hanging out, and they said, "Where are you from?" And I said, "I'm from El Paso." And they said, "The armpit of Texas." And I thought, "Huh, what?" They said with an attitude of you know, kind of like El Paso. Of course, you know, on days like this, there's all the dirt in the air. We might say our own, like, derogatory things about El Paso, but we love El Paso, right? We love the shiny blue skies, the people, right? There's so much that we love that's honorable and exciting about El Paso, and yet there is that attitude. The armpit of Texas, local politics and statewide politics, sometimes people say, yeah, El Paso gets the shaft. It doesn't get any respect in Texas, (laughs) But yet, here we are, and it's a wonderful place to be. But the inscription said Nazareth, right? In the the northern area. If you think back, there was a divide north and south in Israel that took place after Solomon was king. His children, they walked away from God, and they split the kingdom. And so there's the north that was above Jerusalem, basically, that included Nazareth and the Sea of Galilee. And then there was the south. And the north was the first to get wiped out by God as they made their allegiances with a different empire and they chased after false gods. Pilate rubbing it in, perhaps. Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews, would have been the southern kingdom. It's not very clear whether what Pilate had in mind when he wrote that down. The religious leaders, the Jews, they, uh, they asked him to correct it, to make it a little bit more uh, accurate to their charges. After all, he had gone into Jerusalem on a donkey and they shouted Hosanna and they certainly wanted to crown Jesus king in Jerusalem, a capital of a worldly kingdom, but Jesus wouldn't go that route in his kinghood. So they wanted it to say, he says he is, or he said he is king of the Jews. The Pilate Perhaps, in a way, unintentionally fulfilling prophecy, unintentionally declaring a cosmic truth, similar to when the high priest had prophesied that this one man, it was better for him to die for the good of all. Better for one man to die for the good of all. (laughs) He didn't realize how true that was for us when it was Jesus who would be the one going into death. But he's labeled king. Did Pilate believe he was the true king? Not likely. They had that conversation about a kingdom that is not of this world. And so that might have been rolling through his mind. Frustration at the political (coughs) conflict. The the manipulation that those leaders and the crowd was, was, were enacting for Pilate. They were manipulating him. He didn't want to convict Jesus. He didn't want to crucify Jesus, but he was manipulated, pushed, disrespected, bullied, 
You know, he owns his decision, right? He's, he's the boss. He could have done what was right and godly and released the innocent man. But Pilate certainly had a lot of reasons to be aggravated and annoyed at the whole situation. And so maybe he wrote that Jesus was king of the Jews in order to stab back a little bit at the people who were pushing this, this fraud of an execution. But yet the Holy Spirit used Pilate to post the truth. Indeed, Jesus was of Nazareth, born in Bethlehem, the city of David, that he was of the lineage of David. in every way qualified in who he was to be king. And Jesus would go into the war, into the fight, that would indeed not only mean that he's king by qualification, but king by victory. You see, so often, and I, I'd, I'd say that probably the better kings at least for a time, as far as human, speak, human kings can be, are ones that went to war to protect their people. An ancient battle formation often was a, a V. You might see this in movies sometimes. I, I'm tempted to say the movie that I saw this in, but it's, it's PG-13. I don't want to endorse it, but... Uh, the, the first word is a W, and the second word is a W, and it's the first, Wonder Woman. <laughs> they go into battle, and the person who is the leader is right in the middle. It's the head of the formation. And everyone is behind, and the job of that warrior is to lead the victory, Either a victory that would be by that leader's death in leading the entire army forward, giving them courage, giving them a direction, giving them instruction, giving them boldness to fight the enemy and either survive it in victory or die, but hopefully in victory because the rest of the warriors were brave and engaged and directed Upon survival, the head of the formation would be a good head of the community, well, in theory, except for sin, right? But certainly demonstrated an ability to rally the people of strength to achieve a good for the community. And here we have Jesus, a king, a warrior king, going into a battle to win a victory that would supersede all other human struggles or problems. We can have wealth. We can have military strength. We can have great systems of governance. We can have functional processes in our community, businesses, and family, households. We can have those things and yet death will come and hit us hard. Take it away. Ruin what was good. Today I'm a little bit uh, touched by uh, just the ministry that's at hand for us at Zion and caring for each other. Two of our, our members are in hospice, Debbie and Marge. And, um, and so as a pastor going to their bedsides and praying, reading scriptures, reminding them of Jesus while they're unconscious, but maybe hearing, right? Maybe still hearing the, the words of reminders of the victory of Jesus Christ and, and speaking the, the commendation blessing. May God the Father who created you, may God the Son who with his blood redeemed you, May God, the Holy Spirit, who in the waters of holy baptism sanctified you to be his temple, 
receive you into the company of saints and angels to await the resurrection and live in the light of his glory. That commendation blessing is beautiful. There, we had a funeral on Monday at the graveside. Um, Antonia uh, Sutter, I don't know, Julia might know her or Maria might know her. It might have been a little bit before, but uh, they were here at Zion back in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, and have lived out of town, and we're coming here for burial, and what a blessing to get to know the family a little bit, and appreciate the funeral. And another family also grieving the tragic loss of a loved one. But we have a king, King Jesus, who wouldn't settle for earthly pomp and riches and gold and music of trumpets in Jerusalem. He wouldn't settle for the religious leaders or Pilate just manipulating, pretending to honor him when their hearts were not oriented toward that. Jesus would be the warrior king who would go all the way into the, the, the enemy's domain, into death itself. And on that cross with the thorn, crown of thorns and the, 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 the banner over his head posted, King of the Jews, he was coronated for an eternal kingdom of victory against sin, death, and the devil for you and for me, which means that we can point each other to the one who went there first. He went there into ridicule. He went there into abuse. He went there into sadness and despair. He went there into death itself first. And he rose again in victory with a declaration that none of those things, though they may hit you hard, they will not own you because he is the king who wins the fight. And we are his people. And it's a kingdom for you and for me. We're encouraged that Jesus went there. He knows. And we can talk to him when we feel the scorn of the world and we feel the ridicule of enemies. We can, we can talk to him and we can, we can say, Lord, this is just a little bit of what you experienced in your victory for me. And I pray that as you think that and remember this Jesus who goes there first and he wins for us, that like me at that gas, that gas tank so all those years ago, you'd be lifted up a little bit to say, like, all right, you know what? This is part of living. And this is part of loving. And this is part of what's going to happen when we're here because God has chosen to give us life here and let us be his servants here. Another aspect of this, this reading is that the soldiers, they remove his clothes, they cast lots for them. Psalm 22 is where um, we come across the words of Christ's suffering and this, it begins, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Some think that Jesus saying that on the cross was in part because of the weight of our sin and the wrath of God, but also to point us to that psalm and everything that it says there. The prophecies of his clothes being divided and the, the treatment of abuse, the casting of lots, But he hung there naked on the cross. In Hebrews chapter 12, it tells us that Jesus endured the cross, despising the shame. Adam and Eve, they were created naked and they were not ashamed. But as soon as they turned away from God's word and went in the direction of Satan, they were ashamed of their nakedness and they, they hid themselves, they covered themselves. Jesus went 
into the shameful position and condition that has been a definer of our distance from God's design and creation from the very beginning. Whatever the cost, he went there first. The joy set before him, it says in Hebrews 12. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame. We think of his joy as we picture him mistreated and made ashamed on the cross. And the last one, as he's there and nearing to the moment where he would give up his spirit, at a time when any person would, well, we would think that they're completely in their rights to be thinking about themselves. Whether it's the pain that he was enduring or just sad at the situation he was in. Maybe angry at the people who had gotten him there. That those are thoughts that we would think would be normal or natural. The trajectory of his life that had landed him there. Could he have, instead of thinking of the care for his mom, which, wow, what a miracle, that he honors his mother in ensuring that his disciple John would make a priority and make it part of his mission, his duty in life to care for Mary, to care for Jesus' mom. He not only honors that commandment, which commandment, confirmation kids? Fourth commandment, right? Honor your father and mother. He not only fulfills that law for us, but what a contrast to what he could have been thinking. Man, when he was a baby, the king that was in Jerusalem wanted to kill him. And the angel told him to flee. And they went to Egypt. Could he have blamed mom? Why did they bring me back to this country? Right? Surely it's mom's fault. I was raised in this, the word and the promises of God. And what did that get me? It was the religious leaders that orchestrated this betrayal and this, this execution, fraudulent execution. This religion and mom gave it to me, right? I, could <laughs> I don't want to go too far with this because it's, it's so not what Jesus did. He didn't blame mom. He didn't neglect mom. Even there, so close to the end, with redemption for the world and her at hand, he thought of her day-to-day -day needs, that there would be someone who would be with her to protect her, to provide for her, to ensure that when her final breaths would be breathed, that she would have reminders of the life that this King Jesus had won for her too. Jesus cares for us. So much to go into the darkest of darks, the lowest of lows for us. And with kindness and compassion on display, even then, we can also be, we can be sure that that love and that joy that he had for you and for me was there on that cross. Think on Jesus when you feel low. Think on Jesus when you feel vulnerable. Think on Jesus when you feel afraid and know that there is no cause of fear. There is no cause of pain. There is no cause of ridicule or disrespect, scorn or shame that can separate you from the love of God and Jesus Christ because he 
rose. And you are baptized into his answer to all those dark things. We are baptized even more into the resurrection life that he has lived, that he has won, and Jesus is risen, and he is Lord. Be glad, brothers and sisters, and may the Lord bless you as you love each other and encourage each other with these things. Amen. I invite you, because God has made us his people through our baptism into Christ, I encourage you to speak together with me the words of the the Apostles' Creed. And uh, thinking of Mary, this first phrase that I'll sing and that you'll sing at the end of this uh, confession of faith is the first part of Mary's Magnificat, the, the response of faith and joy when she heard the angel announce that there would be a child, Emmanuel, to be born. My soul magnifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. We continue with the offerings of the church. Please stand. Heavenly Father, trusting in your promises, we are bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Lord, have mercy. Christ.
Our Lord God, Heavenly Father, by the blessed light of your divine word, you have led us to the knowledge of your Son. Grant us the grace of your Holy Spirit, that we may ever walk in the light of your truth, and rejoicing with sure confidence in Christ our Savior, be brought into everlasting salvation, through the same Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. For our nation, in the push and shove of interests and plans and priorities of agendas and ideas, that there would be value for all people, that those who are, have the least power would find safety and protection, that there would be uh, a constant uh, provision for the progress and the possibility, the opportunity for those uh, who have less, who have been in positions of weakness, those who have been in positions of, of ridicule and scorn and hate. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For families, that there would be places of encouragement, that there would be uh, love between husband and wife and honor between uh, children and parents, that memories can be made and that uh, long seasons of life can be shared uh, together and certainly where distance is necessary that there can be love shared uh, remotely through communication, through visits, all the means possible. For this, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord have mercy. For our schools and all who work and learn in them, that uh, wisdom would be a joy, that truth would be a priority, that, uh, that there would be safety, honor, and success in teaching and learning for this. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord have mercy. For families that are grieving uh, death, recent or long past of loved ones, that there would be encouragement in the cross, encouragement in Christ who died and rose again to render death impotent. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy for the many people who are struggling with sickness, injury, also uh, recovery from uh, surgeries and other, other accidents or other procedures, uh, that there would be encouragement also in the victory of Jesus Christ and the forever promise of restoration of new body, new soul joined together uh, without the frailties and without the injuries of, of life in the sinful world. But, uh, but that there would be uh, relief from pain and healing according to God's will. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. I thank you, my heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have graciously kept me this day. And I pray that you would forgive me all my sins where I have done wrong and graciously keep me this night. For into your hand I commend myself my body and soul and all things. Let your holy angel be with me, that the evil foe may have no power over me. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. You may be seated. We sing our closing hymn.
beautiful evening. God bless you. Thank you to everyone who brought food also. Have a good night. <laughs>